Good morning, everyone. Boy, am I happy to see you this morning. <laughs> Welcome to the Bucket Courses. It's wonderful to have you here. I'm Joanne Bungie. I chair the CEC, which is very happy to sponsor the Bucket Courses for all of you lifelong learners. Before we get started this morning, I want to acknowledge the work that the planning committee did last week. In addition to doing all of their jobs, they did my job too. And they did a super job of it. Uh, I, it's no wonder that the bucket courses are so successful when you have a planning committee like we have. Really appreciate them. Uh, while I'm thinking of it, uh, please take this time to check your cell phones to make sure they're silenced. You know, we've been doing really well. We haven't had a cell phone go off for the whole course so far. And you get the credit for that. So thank you for your diligence. Well, this morning we begin the fourth class of a five-class course on leadership and uh, crisis taught by Professor Emeritus of History at Brown College, George Drake. You know, we have been talking about uh, whether the times create the leader or the leader has something to do with shaping the times. And I think there are even times when the leader is ahead of the times. Uh, I'll give you an example. When George was a junior at Grinnell College, he ran for student council president, and he lost the election. <laughs> now, George was denied the opportunity to be president of the student council, but years later he became president of the whole college. <laughs> Now, I would like to think that he was probably just ahead of his time, but I think the truth is that the Board of Trustees was a lot better at recognizing leadership potential in the late 1970s than the students were of recognizing it in the mid-50s. So, speaking of time, it's time to turn our class over to George. This is the... Uh, a fourth class of Leadership and Crisis, and I'm happy to introduce President Emeritus of Grinnell College, George Drake. Better turn this on. Okay, I think it's, it's live now. Uh, of course, it's always possible that the students of Grinnell were a bit smarter than the presidents. <laughs> there, there are a lot of ways to interpret that. Uh, and welcome to you all. Thank you very much for coming out. I remember our very first of these classes, it was so terrible, you wondered whether anyone could make it over here. Now it's so nice, you wonder why anyone wants to <laughs> spend an hour and a half indoors. Uh, hearing me. But anyway, thank you for coming and, and again welcome to our online audience uh, at Grinnell College. And by the way, in response to a, a conversation I just had, uh, for those of you who do access the college website, this will not be up until sometime in the summer or the fall because the college is completely restructuring its web, website, the, the, the so-called Lozier program, which everyone disliked. Uh, even the young folks who, are, who, who can navigate anything didn't think it was very good. So the college is putting together a new program, and it supposedly, I think it's, their plan is it will be up this summer or early next fall, and, that, and then this will be put on at that point, so it won't be available immediately. Uh, I want to, uh, since, since last week an announcement was made about today's convocation at the college, I'm going to uh, piggyback on that and and again, remind you that there will be a very interesting convocation at Grinnell College over in the Rosenfield Center uh, 101, the usual venue for these convocations. And lunch will be served, so you need not starve. And if the speaker is Penny Sebring, uh, she is a, a well-known name in this town because she and her husband Chuck Lewis are Sebring Lewis concert hall. Uh, she's a trustee of the college and a very generous donor. And, but more important for today is that she heads a uh, re educational research institute at the University of Chicago. And they particularly focus on urban education issues. And she, that's what she'll be talking about today. 
And, you know, there are lots of curbstone opinions about education these days, and it'd be nice to hear what the researchers are saying. Uh, presumably, we, there's a lot of educational research and a lot of knowledge there that we ought to have access to. So that's, that's the uh, convocation today, and there is time, even for those of us who are stacking chairs afterwards, that, to get over to, the, to that, which will begin at 12 o'clock. And again, I remind you, you, won't, you need not starve. Then, um, a, a word about the uh, handouts that are on your table. Uh, and I'm hoping that you brought your handouts from last time, because that's what we'll be talking about today. Uh, because I, get, I always get behind, it's a good thing with respect to the handouts, because you actually have them a, a week in advance, and you can look at them if you're interested. We may get to a bit of King today, that's my hope, but uh, we may very well not. And just knowing me and how things go, but the, the, I wanted to mention what is uh, what you have. You have something familiar to many of you uh, from the new Revised Standard of the New Testament, uh, Matthew's chapter five through seven, uh, so-called Sermon on the Mount, the sort of ethical demands and standards of the Christian religion, the sort of center of that. And because Gandhi was deeply influenced by the Sermon on the Mount, it was the aspect of Christianity that most influenced him, and because it is such a starkly demanding set of ethical principles, which in fact Gandhi himself tried to follow. He's one of the few human beings I'm aware of who actually tried to follow uh, those precepts. It's interesting to see uh, what is there and how extraordinarily radical that document is. So we'll take a look at that um, to today uh, with respect to the things that are on the tap for today. Now with respect to King, you have three documents. Uh, two, one from 1962 and two from 1963. And it even makes a difference when in those years uh, the document falls because in fact King had a relatively short career because of his assassination, so the progress of his thought and the strategic placement of his thought is interesting to note. The first one is the ethical demands of integration from 1962. And that, the complete speech is there, and it was a speech given at a religious conference, and it allows us to see the degree to which King, as a Baptist Christian pastor, his ideas form around being a pastor, his theological education, he had a PhD in theology, uh, extremely well-educated theologian, and his, uh, his theology enters in to his practical movement for civil rights, and that's very much a part of that particular document. <clears throat> when we talk about King, uh, I will quote sections of it, but uh, would be in class, but not all of it. We have the whole document. Then the most famous of his speeches, the I, I Have a Dream speech. And if you look at a, a sort of panoply of King materials, some of the riffs, the sort of concluding riffs, and I call them riffs because of this sort of uh, elevated, soaring prose, are quotations of himself. He's said those things before. They're not, not the first time he said them, but. Uh, he could put them into probably the most effective co context ever, and he's, he's giving the speech, I'm not sure how many people could hear it, but 200 to 250,000 people at the March on Washington, which at that point had been the largest such demonstration in Washington history. What I'm planning to do with that is to look at it from a point of view of uh, the rhetorical skill that shapes that speech. It is, a, it, it is deservedly one of the great speeches in American history, uh, and very, fairly short, and we'll look at that from that point of view as to just see how extraordinarily skillful King was as a speaker. And when, when I teach this class to the students at Grinnell College and, and to the President Newton, there's a lot of discussion about the role of public speaking in leadership. Uh, and certainly King maybe embodies that almost more, more than anybody else, that leading through speech. We saw that with, with Lincoln, but Lincoln's, because of the technology at the time, is a more restricted uh, impact than it was with King, who 
has the advantage of television and so on. Then, so the first two documents, you have all of the documents. And then the third one is a letter from Birmingham City Jail. We now sort of shorten that to a letter from Birmingham Jail. You have sections of that, They're probably about half of it, maybe a little bit more. Uh, and again, an extraordinarily um, impact of that document. Uh, he's King is responding to eight, uh, within the context of the South, liberal religious leaders. And they are leaders, bishops and so on, rabbi, was a rabbi involved, who have essentially said to King and the movement, what are you doing creating all this havoc? Uh, you are turning the society off on your movement. If you'll just go a little bit more slowly, with more moderation, and by this time in 1963, when they're going to Birmingham, which they see as the absolute core and center of Jim Crow and racist se segregation, and they're, they're so blowing, almost literally, it becomes Bombingham. I mean, there are a, few, a few months later is the bombing of the church where the four young girls were killed. So, I mean, it's, and you could easily accuse, it, that wouldn't have happened had you not come in here and done that. So what King is doing, and again there's a th strong theological perspective in that letter, is he's saying, uh, you people ought to be with us, that in fact you liberals are standing in the way. Uh, there's never a right time for change. And you're just making that old hackney argument, there's never a right time. The change will not happen without being forced. And we are forcing it, and we are going to and he makes appeals that are heavily couched in theology because he's addressing it to Christian pastors. Uh, it was, it's interesting, the letter, letter was an open letter in the newspaper which is brought in by one of the King's visitors, he's in the jail, and in his response he's sort of right in on the margins of the newspaper and, and then put scraps of paper, so when it gets out of the jail, smuggled out of the jail, it has to be sort of put together by the people helping him, and uh, uh, Tommy Haas very nicely very, and very appropriately uh, handed me the Lisa Christian Century article sort of commemorating that letter because it was first published, it was never delivered to these eight days, it was first published openly in the Christian Century and then ended up being read and, and used in millions of churches around the land, so it had a huge impact, and so you, you, I think you see, you'll see with those three is that there's a ton of uh, King writings and speeches and so on, because he, he was giving literally hundreds of speeches in a given year, Cornell College in 1968, just before his assassination, so he was doing that a lot. And uh, these, I think, give you a sort of compendium of uh, King's thought. By the way, uh, and can you see, hear me back, farthest back in the corner, okay. I'm, so, let us uh, go back then to um, Gandhi. How many of you have seen the 1982 film Gandhi? Look at that. Almost all of you. Uh, I always show that film to my students. It's a long film. Uh, it takes, what, two and a half hours? Almost close to three. Yeah. So it, it's, a, it's a long grind, but it's well worth uh, it, it. As a piece of Hollywood history, I think it's one of the best things they've ever done. And Ben Kingsley is, is God. When you can get someone who can portray a famous historical figure in a way that is recognizable to those of us who did have an opportunity to observe in the newsreels and so on, but it is quite extraordinary. So, and, and most of the major incidents that are important in Gandhi's life are there. And I think you see him in uh, all of his glory and peculiarity. In, in this leadership course, the, uh, I think everyone who takes it with me concludes the most consistent of the leaders is Gandhi. He is absolutely consistent, and in, we'll look at it this morning, but in those last readings addressed to the Jews and addressed to the Europeans who are being confronted with Nazism and Hitler, when he is preaching non-violent resistance on the, to the Jews, to the Europeans, if you follow this pattern, Hitler's conscience will be pricked, and Hitler will change his ways. And he believed that. 
and it was absolutely consistent. So as bizarre as it seems to us, uh, particularly those of us of that World War II generation, those of you who fought in it, those of you who suffered from it, uh, those of us who were kids playing war, uh, it's, it's almost inconceivable that someone would take this position, but he, he did. It's a, I think more than anything that we'll see that emphasizes his consistency. Now that did not become an aspect of the movie, uh, it was, but uh, it is an important part of, of the uh, biography. Well, um, just very quickly, the, m many of you are no more than I do, but uh, uh, with respect to his, he was the youngest of four children, uh, he had a deeply religious mother and a political father. Guess what? Politics and religion joined in his life. He is definitely a politician. I had a, a student from Calcutta who took the tutorial a few years ago, and he was just incensed if I ever weren't mentioned the word politician together with the name God. <laughs> For him, politician is always disqualified by dirt politician. <laughs> and he, he would argue and argue in class. It was a great class because he argued the, the other side. But he, he was also terrific because Gandhi, as you probably know, was age 13 when he was married. He was betrothed at age 7. So it's an arranged marriage, definitely of the first water. He himself becomes embarrassed later in life because he was looking forward to the sexual prospects of his marriage. A pretty randy guy in his in his early years, uh, about which he's completely ashamed because in 1906 he swore off any sexual relations with his wife. I don't think he consulted her about this, but he decided that it would, that would solve his life and, and uh, interfere with what he was trying to accomplish as uh, in becoming a full human being. Um, so it, anyway, he's he, he has this early marriage and going back to the student. You can just imagine what great discussions you can have in an American <laughs> classroom when a student says, absolutely right. My parents know much better, more about who I should marry than I do. So there, it's an absolutely appropriate system. Oh, oh the American students would just go through the rest. <laughs> but actually, that was the most exciting to, iteration of this tutorial that I've had because of that particular student uh, who was, you know, Give him full credit. He was able to stand up to eleven other students who were ready to ready to beat him down, string him up, or I don't know. <laughs> um, he is among the better educated of the figures that we're looking at. Uh, you know, we've just managed to get through Washington and Lincoln in three classes, but uh, much the first one we've encountered now who actually has a very good education, educated in India, and then. In, 1888, he goes to London to study for the bar, bar and, and passes the bar and becomes a lawyer in 1891, so he spends three years in London. And that's a really, really important part of his biography because he's come up through the British educational system. He's come up through a, a country where his father actually was a prime minister of uh, a small, uh, Area that I uh, can point it out on our map that you've gotten on the handouts, but I get I was talking about Gujarat, which is this little sort of triangular <laughs> projection on the very uh, western part of India, and there's a town called uh, an area called Parbadar. His father was the prime minister of that area, so he's he's been a, a part of uh, the establishment family, a well-respected family, and uh, and that established. To be part of the establishment under the Raj was to be fully cooperated with, with the British. One of the great arguments he's going to make, and has a huge power of logic, is here we are, millions and millions of Indians who are being ruled by 200,000 British representing the Raj. Why are we acceding to that? There's no way they can rule us without our cooperation. Let's stop cooperating with them, and we will achieve our independence. It won't be easy, it may take a while, but that's fundamentally uh, his, his uh, revolution. Well, see, he's a part of that establishment early on, and that's, that's some of the force of uh, his movement, because he's a convert. When he was in 
London, he dressed as a proper English gentleman. He took music lessons because he thought that's what an English gentleman would do. Uh, he was, he did his very best to be as British as he possibly could be uh, during, and, and this is the pinnacle of it, is the London experience. Well, as it so happens, uh, his first real job as a lawyer happens to be in South Africa. Now, why South Africa? South, the uh, eastern coast of South Africa, the area around Durban, and I don't know, how many of you have been to Durban? Few of you, Sue's been there. <laughs> uh, one of the great um, places in Durban is the Indian market. Uh, Durban, Durban and that area are, it's almost like being in London where every shop seems to be run by an Indian or a Pakistani. Uh, they're, they're just, they're just a, a huge part of that culture. They were brought over in the 1860s as indentured laborers in the sugarcane fields. Durban's a sort of it feels like Miami, uh, Florida, to, to, to be, be, be. It looks like Miami and it feels like Miami. So it's a, it's a climate and a place that, that's conducive to South Asians living there. And then uh, they worked as indentured servants and then won their freedom, uh, stayed on. So there's a significant, significant Indian community in that part of South Africa, and there still is. Uh, some of you know Ron Charles. Some of us have had Ron Charles cutting into us. <laughs> I'm one of them. Uh, Indian, South African. So Ron is from that, from that culture. Um, and he was brought in as a lawyer on a particular case that was actually not in the Durban area, but up in the Johannesburg, Pretoria area. And so he had to travel to, to get to uh, the group of people that he was going to meet with and advise. And on the train, this is a famous incident, very well depicted in the movie, on the train, he's riding first class. He has a first class ticket. And he's dressed, and the movie does this wonderfully well, he's dressed in uh, proper, almost, almost like a tuxedo. It's almost like he's so, so well dressed. Good lawyer, dressed like an Englishman. And he is told by the conductor that as an Indian, or a person of color, he cannot have a first class ticket. He's got to go to third class, so move. And he says, I bought a first class ticket, here's my ticket. And the next scene in the movie is of Gandhi being thrown off the train with his luggage and landing on the platform. And it almost literally, and it's at night, uh, almost literally was the case. And this was uh, sort of the road to Damascus experience for Gandhi. There is something radically wrong. Uh, in, our, in this society, and maybe more generally in society. Uh, and it, it, it's probably a radical demonstration that no matter how British he looks, he still can't fight in first class carriers in a country like South Africa. Uh, and by the way, at that time it wasn't a country, it was the province of Natal, where he was, he was traveling to the province of Tra Transvaal. It didn't become a country until 1900. And so his early agitation is against various, uh, various provincial governments, and then ultimately after 1910 is against the government of South Africa, and he leaves the country in 1915. So he, he hadn't intended to stay, he was an itinerant lawyer, but he, 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 people who you know, help him get out of this predicament, get him to uh, Johannesburg and, and so on. And by the way, the train at that time didn't travel all the way to Johannesburg. It was interrupted. Well, the, line, the lines hadn't been completely constructed, so he's on a coach. And he also has a terrible incident on the coach where they made him ride, made him ride with the driver. He can't sit inside uh, because he's an Indian. So this dramatic demonstration, and, and the way he grew up in India, he didn't encounter the rawness of discrimination because he was part, uh, his family was a part of the administrative structure and he was getting a good British education and so on. So he got a lot of benefit from the, from the Raj, but he wasn't getting any benefit from white society in South Africa. And again, the movie depicts this very well. It, his friends, South African, become his friends, are counseling him not to be so radical about it, because he becomes pretty radical right away. And anyway, he stays, and he, he leads resistance movements, nonviolent, you know, past burnings and that sort of thing, 
uh, resistance to the various governments in, in South Africa, ends up being jailed on several occasions, develops this notion of, of uh, nonviolent resistance against unjust laws, but where you are willing and, and indeed embrace the opportunity to be in prison because you break the law. You're not saying you can't send me to prison. This is an unjust law and being unjustly punished, but I guess I must be punished because that's what the law says. I'm not going to try to break out of prison. In fact, the sense of martyrdom that he develops during his years in South Africa becomes a very important part of what he develops in uh, India when he moves to India in 1915 with something of a reputation uh, but uh, also with and again the movie I think the movie does this very well the, the established members of Congress the, the, the Indian party of resistance uh, have heard about him and uh, he's obviously a person of, of ability and substance but they're very wary of him as he comes in. You can understand that. He's coming in from the outside. They have already worked to establish themselves in the party and so on. And one of the interesting things about Gandhi's leadership is that almost never does he occupy a formal position. He becomes the spiritual leader of the resistance movement, no question about it. People are looking to him for leadership and ideas but he almost never occupies the formal position. And this is getting way ahead of the story, but as on the verge of the independence of India, the major question becomes, how about the Hindu and Muslim populations? Can they get along together? And Gandhi says, of course they can. Of course they can. We are one society, and we should stay together. And Jinnah, the leader of the Muslims, said, we cannot, you are the majority, we cannot trust a, a society in which you are the dominant force, we must separate ourselves. Uh, and one of the um, frustrations that Jinnah has, and, and the movie actually uses a figure that looks quite sinister and acts in a very sinister way. You, you develop a real antipathy to Jinnah in, in the movie. Gandhi, the, the saint, and Jinnah, the, the devil, in a sense. But for, for poor Jinnah's point of view, Jinnah represents the Muslim League. Gandhi says, I don't represent anybody. But they're trying to negotiate. So every time Jinnah says, what is your position? He says, well, this is my position, but I can't speak for Congress. Oh, uh, and it was, in, 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 Jinnah finally gives up. Uh, it's an impossible situation because Gandhi, Gandhi keeps going back to the fact that he's not the formal representative of, of Congress. And yet, Congress, he's doing the negotiation. Um, next week, there is a new digitalized version of Gandhi being released. I anticipate that it is going to have some of the uh, interviews and that kind of thing which typifies uh, modern technology with these digitalized uh, versions. But that's being released next week. Okay, what, what Shane Estes is telling us is that a digitalized version of the Gandhi movie will be released next week. And it'll probably have additional material, as usually happens with these DVDs, uh, to accompany that. So it'll be even better than having the. I, I've got. I possess the old VCR version. I'm sure many of you in this room do. So be well, well uh, advised to purchase the, the digitized version. It really is. If you haven't seen it, or if you haven't seen it in a long time, uh, in a way, I, I should have just. We don't have three hours. I couldn't show it. If you just see the movie, you wouldn't, you wouldn't need to li listen to me. Um, all right. Now let, let's spend a little time with uh, some of the, what one of the readings, uh, and it is the. I'm going to skip the Sermon on the Mount for a little bit and, and pass the map and going to the uh, first of, of the uh, longer re readings. Uh, it's it's the uh, it's on it's the. Page number on the top is 65, page 65. You'll notice as we skip through pages of this document, that's a pretty long document. It is his, his um, manifesto on Indian home rule, which was published in 1909 and was mostly written on the boat in a journey back uh, from England back to South Africa. Uh, that's a long journey, so there was plenty of time uh, 
for him to, to write. Uh, and so the, he put together the spine of, of Indian Home Rule. Uh, and uh, so I, you've got, I've, I've got quite a bit of material from that because it really is his manifesto. It's 1909, but there's very little that happens subsequently that, that changes the, the philosophy and ideas presented here. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to be re uh, reading with you uh, some sections of this, and I'm going to, uh, the first section I'm going to use is, is on that page 65, and it, uh, most of the time I think I can identify where I am pretty readily, but here I'm down about one to five lines from the bottom of that first column, with the sentence that begins, I therefore, oh, it's clearly to the right, so you count up five lines and, and you'll see a sentence beginning, I therefore corrected it to satyagraha. Um, or truth, it implies love and firmness. It engenders therefore and serves as a synonym for force. I thus began to call the Indian movement satyagraha. Am I pron pronouncing that correctly? My Indian pronunciations aren't very good. That is to say, the force which is born of truth and love over nonviolence, or, or nonviolence. So a force, a powerful force, born of truth and love. And the notion of truth for Gandhi is an almost absolute. Truth is an absolute. It's broad. It, it's not a small, narrow thing. It is broad, but it is absolute. So he is not a relativist. There, there, are, there are absolute truths that should shape our lives. And the quest of life is to discover and embody those truths. You discover that truth and you embody that truth. And if you have it, it is shaped by love and it is a force, a powerful force, more powerful than any force in uh, our lives. And I, he gave up the use of the phrase passive resistance. Now, I, uh, there's a certain uh, Ill, uh, Ill logic here because you'll see passive resistance later in the document. And so he, it's pretty hard for him to get. He, he, we in English translate to nonviolent resistance, which has a more forceful sound than passive resistance. And so he's trying to get away from the, the softness of passive resistance, and, and, and Satyagraha embodies it for him, and for us it's best translation is nonviolent resistance. It's resistance, but it's nonviolent. Okay, passive resistance. In connection with it so much so that even in English writing, we often avoided it and used instead the word satyagraha, in other we would insert the Indian term, uh, or other equivalent English phrase. This then was the genesis of the movement which came to be known as satyagraha, and of the word used as a designation for it. So probably the most important word uh, for understanding Gandhi's thought. Now I'm flipping. It, 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 the way they Xerox this stuff, it's sort of just, I guess, you end up flipping like that rather than sort of turning the page. You flip it over. And we're now, you can see on page 105 of Engine Home Rule, civilization. Now this is a really, really important uh, section. Think of it this way. Gandhi spent so much focus that culminates in London with adapting British civilization to, to the highest degree and absorbing it and representing it. And he finds that it is an absolute dead end. It ended up on the platform in Peter Maritzburg off, off the train being dumped unceremoniously off the train. That's what you get for civilization. I mean, in way, in, if you think of it sort of personal uh, terms of, of the insult that he felt at that point. So part of his movement is to reject civilization. You're going to reject British rule. We're also going to reject their civilization. We of India have a much greater civilization, a much more profound civilization. Why are we chasing after this ephemeral thing that's driven by machines and technology and so on? So he rejects the modern world. And You'll, you'll see there's a, in one of these quotes, he's, he's quoting the Muslims, and then we, we're seeing some of this today, and, and aspects of Islam that are rejecting Western culture, yeah, that are uh, along with a sort of in religious and political independence, and it definitely forms 
uh, Gandhi's ideas. Uh, Harold's here and knows a whole lot more about this than I do, but I said it, I think last time, I'll say it again. With Gandhi, he's very open to the breadth of religious experience. Again, Hindus are more open than most religious groups. They're willing to borrow and accept, and, uh, and Gandhi very much embodies that, so that some orthodox Hindus would think he's not narrow enough, and of course he's assassinated by a Hindu, so, uh, because of his reaching out to the Muslims. So it isn't as though all, of, all Hindus are as broad as he, and you, I guess you could, I don't know whether Hindus argue he's not an Orthodox Hindu or not. Do they, Harold? What do they, what do they say? I think it's a very complicated issue. I don't, you know, because he is a, a complete pluralist uh, in the sense of John Hick, and that's complicated, but truly believe that it's a sacred duty to study all religious traditions and all religions are true, and all religions are false, which means that there, there's truth, but there's falsehood, and human beings have the duty to seek the truth in, in religious traditions. But he was really, uh, he stands for a kind of equality between the religious traditions, that all paths are, are, have the possibility of leading to, to truth. Okay, well, I'll repeat what, what, what Harold said, and uh, I won't, probably won't get all of it right, but uh, most of you in this room know, and certainly the people uh, uh, watching online will know, that Harold Casimal is, is truly an authority on religious traditions. And what he, what he said essentially was that Gandhi was absolutely open to the truths in various religious persuasions, but also recognizing, and as Harold said, all, most of these persuasions, all have truth, embody truth, but they're also error. Or, <coughs> and so Gandhi's, uh, in a way he's culling, he's pulling out the things that fit together in his notion of truth, his discovery of truth. And as, as we'll see from the Sermon on the Mount, he finds some basic truth, truths there. So I'll uh, read a little bit more, and then we'll, we'll, we'll take a break. Joanne's showing me that it's time for a break, and uh, as usual, I'm waiting for time. Uh, I, I'm uh, reading on, on the civilization. We'll just see, I'm not going to read all of this section, but we'll read just a little bit just to get the flavor of, his, of his, uh, what he's presenting. I'm down here, it's under that section, civilization, chapter 6. I'm down, in, after that there's two lines, and then there's a little bit of a break, the editor, and the second line of what the editor says, just after the quotation civilization. It's true test lies in the fact that people living in it make bodily welfare the object of life. We will take some examples. The people of Europe today live in better built houses than they did a hundred years ago. This is considered an emblem of civilization. And this is also a matter to promote bodily happiness. <laughs> Formerly they wore skins and used spears as their weapons. Now they wear long trousers and for <laughs> embellishing their bodies they wear a variety of clothing. And instead of spears, they carry with them revolvers containing five or more chambers. If people of a certain country who have hitherto not been in the habit of wearing much clothing, boots, etc., adopt European clothing, they are supposed to have become civilized out of savage, savagery. There's Gandhi's early experience. He, uh, born an Indian, but put on good, proper English clothes and uh, has moved out of savagery into civilization. Now we're familiar with Gandhi in his loincloth. He goes absolutely the other way. And he makes a very compelling argument. He says, here we are in India, we're growing cotton. What do we do with it? We send it off to Manchester, England. Get a little money for it, a little bit. They make it into proper English clothes and sell it back to us at inflated prices. What are we doing? Let's just take our cotton, spin it into homespun cloth, and wear very simple clothing. In fact, only a loincloth in his case. Guess what image is on the Indian flag today? The spinning wheel. So Gandhi makes a, uh, a, a, a symbol of spinning. Again, if you saw the movie, his conversation is often with somebody while he's spinning. And he spun every day. Uh, 
to the degree that it was absolute. When he went to London for a conference, he took his spinning wheel with him uh, so that he could spend a little time every day spinning. It becomes uh, symbolic, but more than that, with, again, with Gandhi's quest for truth, it becomes absolutely essential to who he is and what he represents in this effort to reject, I mean, in every sense of the word, reject that civilization, return back to the basic elements of Indian society, and obviously, in so doing, we take the steps toward divesting ourselves of their political control. We're, let's divest ourselves of economic control, let's create our own economy, our own society, indigenous, and in the process, we mentally, spiritually, and in a way physically, uh, separate ourselves from the British. We've got, to, we've got to separate ourselves from that dependence in order to assert our own vitality uh, toward independence for Indians. Okay, let's stop uh, and take our 10 minute break and we'll go on with Gandhi. Thank you for coming back, everyone. It's good to have you. You will notice that you have an Ace of brochure on your tables this morning. Next week is our last class of the bucket courses for the season, and we will begin again next September 11th. In the meantime, this summer, we have the ACES courses going on. That is a, a partnership between the college and the Community Education Council, of which the college is also a member. And in the summertime, we do four courses, two classes each. And it, it is in this room on Wednesday mornings at 10 o'clock. So you just kind of have to keep doing what you're doing. And that starts on uh, June 12th. And you'll see here uh, what the, the uh, courses are going to be. Uh, you can fill out the uh, blank on the back of it, send it to the college. There is no tuition charge. We do like to have you register, however, so that we know how many people to plan for in terms of handouts and refreshments and so on. There is no tuition. It is sponsored by the college. So we we'll hope that you will all uh, take advantage of that this summer. We hope to see you on June 12th. But next week, we will still be here with the bucket courses. And right now, we'll finish off this class with George Drake and Leadership in Crisis. Okay, I think it's on. By the way, I meant to just mention, I didn't bring this up here because I'm going to read from it. You have the Xeroxes from it, but this is the book from which those Xeroxes are drawn by Homer Jack, and it's, just, it's, it's essentially Gandhi's writings uh, with good editorial comments. So it's readily available, still in print. It's been out for a long time, but, but remains in print. Now, I, I had planned to read uh, a fair amount from this document, the Indian Home Rule, but clearly with, uh, in the interest of time, I'll do less from it than I had originally intended to do. Uh, but uh, if you look, turn the, turn the page and look at what's uh, numbered 106 at the top, there's a long section, a fairly effective section, in which he talks about machines and our enslavement to machines. That, 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 what, what, civilization does to us in that way. And then he goes on, I think I will read a little bit of this. I'm, I'm at the very bottom of that first column, 106, with the sentence that begins in the last line, this civilization takes note neither of nor morality nor of religion. Its votaries, and we're now over 107, its votaries calmly state that their business is not to teach religion. Some even consider it to be a superstitious growth. Others put on the cloak of religion and prate about morality. Even a child can understand that in all I have described above, there can be no inducement to morality. Civilization seeks to increase bodily comforts, and it fails, fails miserably even in doing so. In other words, even, uh, we don't even get as much comfort as we think we will from civilization. It is, uh, in, in a way, he's not, he's not saying it's amoral, it's immoral. Uh, and it gets in the way of our morality because it, it is super, solely superficial. And remember, he's seeking truth, that, that absolute. And the things that are superficial get in the way of our search 
retreat. We have to push aside the superficial to get to the most basic elements uh, of life. And then he goes on in that section to, at the end, he, he takes pity on the poor English because they are so misled by their uh, whoring after, after civilization. Um, then in, uh, if you turn the sheet where there's only one little short snippet where he talks about uh, achieving home rule actually through passive resistance and having, this is what, uh, an example of where he says earlier in the document he's not going to use passive resistance, but in fact it uh, falls into it. But by the way, um, the, 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 this was originally written in Gujarati, so some of it, uh, it, it I forget now whether he did his own English translation or whether it was translated by someone else. Um, there's a, uh, I'm now flipping over to the se section that says 114 and 115, um, and uh, one of the things I, I would uh, point, I guess the most radical thing I can look at, and again I'm skipping what some of the things I intended to use, I'm over on 115, uh, the second column, and here is, uh, <laughs> it's 12 lines down almost virtually in the middle of that first parrot, long paragraph section, where you have a sentence beginning in the second half of the line, after a great deal of experience. If you can find what that is, it's 12 lines down, a little bit more than halfway down. After a great deal of experience, it seems to me that those who want to become passive resistance, resistors for the service of the country have to observe perfect chastity, adopt poverty, follow truth, and cultivate fearlessness. Now think of that. If you are going to be a true resistor, if you're going to be a convert to this movement, you're going to have to be chaste, you've got to adopt poverty, you have to follow truth, discover it and follow it, and be fearless. Now Gandhi was all of those things. And essentially, I, I, it may be a certain amount of hubris, he said you've got to be like me. He is, he is by this time chased. In 1906, he's given up sexual relations with his wife, and his autobiography, he's very critical of himself and his early sexual desires, and he feels, I mean, it's monastic. And I'm going to get into that in a minute, because this ashram is really a kind of monastery. But it, it is kind of, we, we're, we're familiar with this approach to Christian monasticism, where you deny the flesh in every conceivable way, even, and Gandhi follows this to the point of uh, diet. Uh, or he doesn't do this one, but the monks would wake themselves up every two or three hours and go pray. We like, I'd like to get a good seven hours, right? No, you can't do that. That's, that's self-indulgent. Uh, break yourself up and go pray every two hours. I mean, the monastic hours just work that way. And, so, it, it, we're familiar, I mean, it really is not, I think, uh, uh, overstating it to make that comparison to Christian monasticism. Then, uh, I talked about cloth before, and so I'm flipping the page over to what, the one that has 118 at the top, and I'll read just a little of, of this. Um, I'm starting in the column, that's just the abbreviated column at the bottom of the page, I'm starting with the second line from the bottom, the sentence that begins, we do not need any European cloth. We shall manage with articles produced and manufactured at home. You may not keep one eye on Manchester and the other on India. We can work together only if our interests are identical. And then he goes on in, in the same uh, vein, but that, that's a pretty clear statement of what he's going to do with respect to one of his principles is we buy local. We talk about that in Grinnell. I try to buy every gallon of gas I buy in Grinnell. You know, let's let that the taxes go here to help pay for this building, for example. Uh, but, uh, and so, you know, we're, we, we associate with that. And uh, it's particularly important, again, where he's trying to say 200,000 British can't dominate us. There's just no way they can dominate us if we cooperate with them. And one of the best ways to cease cooperating is to cease buying their products, manufacture locally, we build ourselves up, and we, we erode our dependence on the British. Well, I, I, I think I'll uh, move on from that particular document, but 
but at your leisure, uh, read all of it. I think it's, a, it's, it's very, very reflective of Gandhi's ideas. Um, I want now to talk very quickly, uh, and this will get us into the Sermon on the Mount, about uh, the ashram or the, co the community that he formed. He did this in South Africa. There were two communities that were formed by Gandhi in South Africa, and at least one of them still exists outside of Durban. Uh, and as soon as he arrives in India, and this is really extraordinary. The movie shows him, and, and I think this is an aspect. He does travel around India. I've got, to, I don't, you know, he hasn't been there for 20 years. Uh, so he's going to find out what the country's like. Uh, and he does traveling around. But then, as a leader of a movement, he goes out in the countryside and forms this little community, you know, kind of a village a community, with certain rules. And uh, it, it's extraordinary. I mean, what, what leader of a community says, I'm going to go out into the booties and uh, found a kind of monastery? Uh, so that in a way, it's almost they've got to come to me rather than me going to them. That's not quite the case, but it, it, there's an element of that. Now let's look just quickly uh, at the Sermon on the Mount, and then I'm going to talk about a little bit about the ashram and the rules of the ashram. And I'm certainly not going to read all of the Sermon on the Mount, but for most of us in the room, we know that it's, in this case, Matthew, the book of Matthew, chapters 5 through 7, and it begins with the Beatitudes. Uh, I'm, I'm actually, this is easy for me to tell you where I am because we've got chapter and verse. So I'm in the fifth chapter, and I'm at verse 27, which is over in the second column, concerning adultery. And I'm reading some of the more radical precepts in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, things that most of us would say are unrealistic, or elements of unrealism. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. What president of the United States? <laughs> and think of the ridicule that poured down on Jimmy Carter for making, he's a good Baptist, he's trying to follow the Sermon on the Mount, and he simply admits, I've looked at other women and my wife with lust. Uh, and we laughed at it. Generally, I don't know anyone in this room laughed at him, but generally our society said this is what makes him an inept president, unfit to be president of the United States. Oh. Um, and, well, going on, if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. Now, there's a lot of biblical scholarships that said, did Jesus really mean that? Or is, it, or is, is this a figurative uh, statement? Um, well, uh, uh, and, you know, a whole lot of aspects of your body that cause you to offend, cut off your own hand, and so on. We are familiar with these kinds of precepts in some religions that still have those kinds of punishments, and this is a, a, a Near Eastern religion uh, coming out of that same environment, and again, we can excuse it as modern-day Christians or modern-day re religious people. Nevertheless, you have to contend with it. You have to find and the point with Gandhi is he almost literally, I mean, he said, the Sermon on the Mount touched my heart. It reached to my heart, my very heart. And it's one of the major precepts, religious <coughs> precepts, that he tried to live by. And, and, uh, and, and as, as Harold pointed out, it's the sort of thing that Hindus are perfectly, and particularly Gandhi, perfectly capable of doing. Um, well, I'm going over now to uh, uh, verse 43. Again, same chapter, next column over. <clears throat> you have heard it that it is said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And the counsel of perfection is exceedingly important to Gandhi personally uh, and as, as part of his movement. Now, and again, you can see this has really invested in Gandhi's nonviolent resistance. And it'll be kicked, picked up by King. You, you will... Uh, work against, hate may be too, too, too strong a word, the product 
of the oppressor, but you do not hate the oppressor or your enemy, in other words. Uh, you love. You work with your oppressor in a spirit of love. And it's, it, it's key to what Gandhi did, key to what King will do. You, you. And in fact, as a strategic or tactical uh, matter, it works. I mean, we can see that. I mean, if you, it, 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 we see it in our own lives. If people treat you badly and you treat them well, you find that you can sometimes build the bridges that would otherwise not, not have happened. That we, many of us, most of us I think in this room, try to live that way. That's a precept that we try to follow. But that counsel of perfection is, of course, um, virtually impossible to achieve. Well, as they all say, impossible to achieve. I'm flipping the page now and going over to uh, chapter 6. Um, this is an interesting one. Verse, verse 16, that's in the first column, concerning fasting. This is one, I would say, that Gandhi broke. And whatever you do, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Well, the, the most powerful technique that Gandhi developed was the fast. Once he became an icon of the movement and of Indian society, then the preservation of his life by the larger society was important. And even to the British, or even to the Muslims, in the case where uh, he fasts over the riots in Calcutta as India is beginning to break up and partition uh, in, in the last phases of independence. Uh, so he, it's powerful enough that it brings his opponents around. And he was willing to fast unto death. So fasting was not in private. Not that he puts, you know, disfigured himself. He did not do that. He's, He's, he's not making it worse than it is. But he uses the fast as a technique to accomplish his goals. So there's no sense in which it's secret. The world knew when Gandhi was fasting. And he made sure that the world knew that. And Gandhi was certainly not above using the press. Just as the civil rights movement depended on television images to bring our society around, so Gandhi depended on newspaper reporters. And they were alerted to what was coming so that they would cover and, and uh, affect opinion in India, but worldwide. And the British are a worldwide power. And so he wants to bring the world's uh, opinion against the British with respect to uh, the independence movement. Um, well, it, I, I'll, I think I'll not uh, go, at, go on with the Sermon on the Mount anymore, but if you, it's, it's a radical document. Uh, it's one that I think uh, I myself feel uh, feel it in, in you know the, the things that I think I try to live by, but there's no way that I even attempt to fulfill the admonitions of the Sermon on the Mount. And very probably I can speak for many in the room. Uh, Gandhi tries to do it. Now it's not because he's tied to this is an orthodox position. It's because he sees truth here. He's seeking truth, and he sees the power of the truth of what is in the Sermon on the Mount, and he assimilates it. So then he creates uh, these ashrams, and he actually comes up with vows that you must take to be part of the ashram. And here's where, uh, if I were doing this in the modern way, that is to say with PowerPoint, they'd all be up here in front of you. I didn't say rocks them, so you're going to have to sort of depend on pulling these out of the air. Uh, and no, don't, don't, no need you to copy this down, but just just to, to, to see the sort of assemblage of things that he holds up as the standard for human behavior. The vow of truth. Uh, it is an absolute truth that endu endures in all times and in all ways. The vow of non-killing, it's ahimsa in, uh, in uh, Hindi. Uh, but more than that, you don't offend anyone and you love your enemies. So you know, you're, you're going to be not a non-killer, but you're also non-offensive and loving all. 
A vow of celibacy. It's essential to a truly religious life to be celibate. And that's, that's a powerful statement. You cannot, I mean, it's a monastic statement. You cannot be ultimately what you should be as a religious human being unless you're celibate. Uh, the control of the palate. Eating is an animal passion. And we should curb our animal nature as much as possible, so we should control it. We don't starve ourselves, except when it does fast but we control our power. This is an interesting, the vow of non-thieving. And in a way, uh, it, you know, I, I shouldn't be, well, it's, it's communist, but I should, be, should say that. But you should not possess more than you need. And the moment you possess more than you need, you're a thief. I guess looking around this room, we're all thieves, right? <laughs> uh, and uh, Sue is less of a thief than I am. She'd like to get rid of more stuff than I do. Uh, so, but I'm a, I'm a huge thief. I have a lot more than I need. But I mean, that's, that's a powerful vow. Uh, and what would, and here in an impoverished society, and if, if you redistribute the wealth, uh, there's no need for anyone to starve in India, no need for anyone to starve anywhere, or to be truly deprived. Uh, but so, in, you know, in our capitalist society, I guess we've got a system which makes thieves of us all, and, and it sort of comforts them in, in, in Gandhian terms. Uh, a vow of Swadesh, which is to buy locally, only Indian goods should be bought. A vow of fearlessness, when you fear God, you fear no man. So you're fearful of God, but of no human being. And critical, and it's well done in the movie, a vow uh, regarding untouchables. A reforming, there he's trying to reform a basic element of Indian society, society which he pulls out as a wonderful civilization, could teach the world, but there are uh, terrible aspects of that society, and untouchability is one of them. Uh, and the movie dramatizes that well in the ashram <coughs> setting, where Gandhi's wife, uh, is asked to, to serve food to an untouchable and so on, and she refuses to do it. And Gandhi, you know, one of the few times in the movie that he is allowed to be angry, and he's angry at his wife, and he's asked forgiveness, but he feels very strongly about how wrong untouchability is. Vow of education through the vernacular. Now that, I mean, it, it, it's by no means happened in, in, in modern Indian in, society. The lingua franca of, Eng of India is English. That's the one language that covers the entire country. And Gandhi's saying we should get rid of English. We should go back to indigenous languages. It doesn't quite contend with the problem of how you're going to communicate across the language groups. One of the impacts of colonialism around the world is that European languages have become lingua franca. Uh, when Sue and I were in the Peace Corps, we happened to be in a society which had one indigenous language. And their English was terrible, because they didn't need it. But in most African countries, the different tribal languages mean that when they go to school, the European language, be it German, French, Portuguese, English, is the means of communication across the groups. And so their English skills go develop rapidly. And uh, our, our uh, Pakistani and uh, Indian <laughs> students, of which are abundant at Grinnell College, have impeccable English, mm. better than most of our English. Uh, they really do learn, it's been extremely useful to their society, to their independent society. So this is probably not a vow, I mean, it, it, it's of a piece and consistent with other things that Gandhi's doing, but one that has not a whole lot of practical value, in my opinion. Uh, the vow of Kadar, the dignity of labor, you should use your hands, the spinning wheel, uh, on homespun cloth. And then, interestingly enough, the vow of the religious use of politics. So there you have Gandhi's mother, Gandhi's father come together. He is a politician. He accepts that uh, in his life. He's working politically, but it is undergirded, infused with religion his religious beliefs, and we'll see that with King. There's no way you can separate King from his Christian religion and from being a Baptist pastor. Um, 
Well, I'm, we're, we've got about 15 minutes left, and I would like to allow us some time to discuss Gandhi's leadership qualities. So I'm going to just point out, and I had not intended to read this anyway, that you have um, a, uh, a Xerox of the Darasam assault raid. Uh, and I, would, I had not intended to read this anyway, because it, it is a newspaper description by a, a United Press correspondent named Webb Miller, uh, and it is very dramatically depicted in the Gandhi movie. Uh, Gandhi does a salt march in 1930, and it is, again, of a piece with his resistance against the British from a very indigenous point of view. Here we have salt surrounding us in the ocean, and there are salt pans set up near the ocean, and we are not allowed to uh, use that salt without paying a tax to the British who are in re responsible for controlling the manufacture of salt. Oh, God, he said, this is a freely God-given product. Anyone can create a salt pan. Anyone can go to the ocean, particularly those who live there, he grew up by the ocean, and make salt. So he makes this 200-mile walk uh, people are following on and goes and makes salt illegally. Uh, and then he's imprisoned for what he's done, and then it's, this effort is carried on at the Dara Sama Salt Works, which is a salt pan. And people are coming, and the, the British know they're coming, and in fact the uh, guards are Indians working for the British. And these people just march right up to these guards and get clumped. Two of them are killed, over 300 are badly injured. Uh, when when uh, the students and the, guy, the guys in the prison, even more so, they could not understand this. They were revolted by it. It's, it's very, very graphically portrayed in the movie. And uh, they just were revolted. Why would anyone do that? That's an element of non-violent resistance that they couldn't get their minds around. And our students have a hard time getting their minds around. Any of us have a because they go up in waves and are clubbed, to, clubbed and they pull them over to the tents to take care of them and the next wave comes and they get beaten and they pull them away. Uh, and well, after you've seen the first wave get beaten, how is, what does it take to walk up there and get clubbed? Uh, you know, absolutely you know, clubbed to your knees or up to, you know, back and prone and supine and so on. So, but it's powerful. It is, it's powerful and of course in the, in, it's this whole issue of, well, he's dealing with the British, who do, do, after all, have a conscience. They are a country of laws, and uh, are beginning to see uh, that their effort to, to hold on to India is a huge price, a moral price, and a price in, price in many, many respects. But, uh, despite all that Gandhi and his movement do, in and out of jail, techniques like the salt march and so on, they nevertheless are making very slow progress toward independence. So the real issue in, uh, on independence is what would have happened without World War II? Because World War II really does change things. Uh, the colonial power, and there's, a, there's a lot in, in the Gandhi readings about what Gandhi's advising during the war. Uh, the Japanese, who are right on the borders of India, in Burma, think that they, India would be easy pickings because would not the Indians welcome them? Well, Gandhi takes the lead and say, we don't welcome you. We don't welcome the British, but we certainly don't welcome you. And lots and lots and lots of Indians fought for the British in World War II. And, uh, and the Congress movement had a hard time deciding whether they were going to support that or not. They were really torn by how, what their, their attitude should be in World War II. Um, not, we won't go into uh, just, it, you know, uh, say, look at the, what, what Gandhi has to say to the Jews and to the Europeans. He's praising the French for rolling over. They did exactly the right thing. They didn't engage in this carnage by resisting Hitler. They said, okay, come in. Uh, and 
he sees this as the way. If that happens universally in Norway and Britain and so on, then Hitler really will recognize the error of his way. Well, most of us, I think, would say Hitler and Hitler's Germany are a little different from the British. Anyway, after World War II, uh, it's pretty clear that the days of the British Empire are numbered. And critical, critical, critical is that, and, and, and those of us who lived through it could understand how Winston Churchill could get voted out in the election in 1946. Uh, and Clement Attlee and the Labor Department, the government replaced the, the great hero of the British resistance, of the British war effort. Rose, I mean, uh, Churchill would never have seen it in India. Never. I mean, he saw it as a jewel of the crown. He was a, a, an imperialist of the absolute first order. And that could have been part, I think it was part of the reason for his defeat. But generally speaking, the British people felt, recognized maybe it's too strong, strong term, but felt that uh, the post war situation in Britain would better be addressed by the Labour Party than by the Conservative Party. So at the Atlanta government comes in, and very quickly they begin to negotiate for the uh, freedom of India. And so that change in government, the post-World War II world, and India leads the independence efforts around the world. It's the first of these major colonies to win its independence. So the work that Gandhi did was exceedingly important, but would it have succeeded without the change in the world? came about in World War II, and then Gandhi's absolutely bitter disappointment. He, he did not welcome this period. It was a period of intense uh, disappointment and anguish for Gandhi because he thought Muslim and Hindus should remain together, and, the, and there was no way, no part of India that was so totally either Muslim well, I say was so totally Muslim that you could say, yes, it, it should be independent unto itself. It, re it required exchange of populations. Hindus left what's now Pakistan and what, what is now Bangladesh, which originally was East Pakistan. I mean, originally Pakistan was divided by India, and, it, and, and East Pakistan became its own country. But the interchange of populations of Muslims moving into now Pakistan and Hindus moving out of Pakistan uh, and the, the continuing problem that you have between India and Pakistan. Gandhi anticipated all of that and it was a better, it, it just took all the joy away from him at, at, at actual independence because he thought it was moving in the wrong direction and he was so vocal about it and this, that last fast over the riots in Calcutta between Muslims and he stopped the riots through his fast, but he certainly didn't change the course of history. Um, that uh, was what then produced a, a, you know, an Indian, a Hindu, very uh, strong, we would say, you know, right wing or whatever Hindu, who assassinated him in, in 1948. So, five minutes left for general discussion about what you think of a leadership technique uh, that I think. It, I'm about highlighting, I get a lot of highlighting, I guess, the, exactly how he tried to influence his opinion. Uh, a person who is trying to, to lead as a saint, uh, a person who uh, never willingly accepted a role of leadership, formal role of leadership, uh, who spent a lot of time in a monastic <coughs> setting. Nevertheless, influence has huge influence. So, comments, questions? Shane. Um, can you address, when we read in Gandhi's stuff, he talks about civilization. It sounds to my ear like he's talking Western civilization. Obviously, there are other civilizations, for instance, Asian. So, therefore, could you address that? The, the, question, the question was, what did Gandhi mean by civilization? And, and Shane say, uh, Estes is saying that it, it, what he seems to mean is Western civilization, not all civilization. And, and he, he, it, it, if you read that full section, yes. I mean, he trumpets Indian civilization and he calls it that. And he's saying that 
Westerners have misappropriated the term civilization as they've gone around as imperialists and uh, addressed you know, people in loincloths and spears and so on and said, you are savages and the only way to be civilized is to be like us. And he's saying, no, India was a great civilization long before this thing, Britain, and, and in fact, fact, what they've constructed is not civilization, it's very uncivilized, as well as the Indians are. Too. I found a good quote from Gandhi that addresses that. Is, uh, he was asked uh, what he thought of Western civilization, and his response was, I think it would be a good idea. <laughs> the Gandhi quote is uh, when asked what he thought of Western civilization, he said, I think it would be a good idea. I mean, did I get it right? It would be a good idea. That's important. It would be, not is, but it would be a good idea. Other comments or questions? We've got two or three more. more. Yeah, yes. I was privileged to attend session here at Grinnell College for Cesar Chavez that also used fasting as a means to accomplish something. I don't know what year it was, but it was here. And I don't know what the was. I thought that was a neat thing. The comment was that Grinnell College probably would have been in the 80s maybe, or 70s, probably the 70s. Uh, a uh, session at Grinnell College with Cesar Chavez, who led the, you know, the workers in California and so on, uh, you talked about fasting as a technique for accomplishing your goals. And in, in truth, I think, uh, I mean, Gandhi isn't the first pastor, but I think in terms of the breadth of knowledge of that as a technique, he was the one who developed it. And, and there's just so much. Uh, again, th those of us and many of us in this room are of that generation. Remember how much of an icon Gandhi became for all of society. And it's just no wonder that the American Civil Rights Movement used so many Gandhian techniques because they became a kind of gold standard for accomplishing your goals through nonviolent means. And so it's not, not surprising that, that the workers in California might think of that as a, a way of achieving things. Jim? Fasting actually is being used somewhat effectively right now in Guantanamo by right. the prisoners. Jim Kottmeyer's uh, comment is that we're seeing it right now in Guantanamo, and in fact the administration, got, uh, Obama's coming back to his original position that maybe we ought to close Guantanamo, and it, what, more than half of the prisoners are fasting as we speak. Yes. Uh -huh. yeah. Tell me. Um, does nonviolent resistance depend on an educated um, population like the British? Um, the, the, the question is, does nonviolent uh, resistance depend on dealing with an educated, uh, okay. fairly sophisticated populace such as the British. Uh, I, I think it depends on a, a uh, society that believes in the rule of law and that has uh, some pretense toward morality. I think that, and probably that goes along with some element of education and sophistication. But, uh, you know, the, again, the great contrast is Hitler's Germany and uh, England or any country like that. And, We'll maybe talk off a little bit more about that next time. I'll try to. Next time, clearly, we'll do King. We might mention Mandela. Uh, <laughs> but we, we should not give short shrift to King and then we deal with some of these more general questions. So thank you very much for your patient indulgence. Thank you. Thank you all for coming this morning and sharing your beautiful morning with us. Look forward to seeing you all next week. Same time, same place. Thanks.